Hey everybody, happy Friday and happy almost weekend to all of you. I'm glad you're joining today for a little master class talking once again about composition. Now this is the third in this series of uh, little chats I'm having with all of you about this and I hope that um, you're going to enjoy it. So here we go. I am going to be looking at uh, really quickly just what we ended the class with last week which was uh, this little exercise. I hope that some of you had a chance to try it out. Um, and this was where we had three objects, a bottle, a circle, or a, could be a sphere if you like, and a line. And the challenge was to try and come up with 12 at a minimum compositions uh, where you're going to be using these to create um, little thumbnail illustrations and arrange these in such a way that they would be interesting to the viewer. And what's great about these three shapes is that they give you a nice um, range of possibilities here. Uh, each of them has uh, their own qualities that can be uh, taken advantage of regarding um, not just the shape language there, but uh, if you scale them up, scale them down, put one in front of the other. So using overlap, which we talked about as a great trick in composition for creating some kind of a depth, right? Um, then you're going to be in great shape. So here are the three examples that I gave for you right up here at the top. And I hope some of you were able to come up with some really neat ones. We want to move on from this exercise today to take a step back and look at some more examples of some uh, paintings that take advantage of some of the tricks that we mentioned in the first two episodes. Um, and then add to that the uh, two, two things that we didn't talk that much about, one of which is arabesques. Write that here for you. All right, arabesque. An arabesque is what I just did right there. It's a nice curvilinear passage, okay? And these are not always obvious. They're not done in, in such a um, immediately obvious way uh, with the artist. It's not like there's a line in the work that's gonna say, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. No, it's not quite like that, but I'll show you um, with the first example I wanna talk about today what I'm talking about with arabesques. And then the second thing I wanna talk about is leading lines, which really an arabesque is a kind of a leading line in many ways, but uh, it can also just be a way to um, bring some harmony to an illustration or painting. And um, when you start to look for them and notice them, I have to tell you, it's really cool because you, you, didn't, you can't stop seeing them everywhere. Uh, and when you don't see them in a piece of work, you, you kind of miss them. Um, a lot of the times, depending on what it is that the illustration is. But for the most part, a lot of these, these paintings that catch your attention will be uh, filled with these really helpful and uh, deliberate arabesques. Um, so let's take a look at something here. This is a painting done by, I believe, a student of Raphael, or at least somebody who studied um, his paintings and his work. Um, and the artist is unknown, but says it's uh, after Raphael, the triumph of Galatia, I believe is how you say this. Could also be Galatea, but I'm going to say Galatia because, hey, it's my show. Uh, I want to take a look at this one because this is just one of those perfect uh, paintings to look at when we talk about the power of an arabesque. Okay, um, Big, medium, and small. They're all in here. And I'm looking, by the way, uh, at the chat, and I notice that for some reason my show is not going out live to Behance. So I'm just going to type a quick note here. Alrighty, there we go. All right, so um, looking at this painting here, I want to crack this open. Got this in a little layer group. Let's first just overlay a little armature on that. Remember last week we talked about these beautiful harmonic armatures, right? For create dynamic symmetry. And this is about the simplest one you could really overlay on top of it. You've got the image bisected, uh, both vertically and horizontally, and then diagonally as well. And then we have our nice right angles that are created um, with these lines that come across diagonally here. And uh, what we get, though, when you look at this is, well, my goodness, 
where is our focal point? Well, in this instance, it is right here in the center of our illustration. All right, I'll just pick another color here so I can, there we go. So look at this, falls squarely, squarely within that center third, right? And this is again, one of those things where I want everybody to understand the rule of thirds is lovely. The rule of thirds is also not the law. It's not true that you have to place your focal point here, 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 or here to immediately make it work compositionally, okay? Um, which is not to say that using that trick, right, putting a focal element here and then balancing it somehow with some other activity here perhaps and here, Okay, it's not to say that this will not work. It does work. It works because, you know, it just does. But listen, folks, uh, to limit yourself, to limit your thinking to locking things in where well, I've just absolutely got to put my focal point on one of these intersections, all right, on this grid. Please don't concern yourself with that. Here we have our focal point right in the center of our painting. And yet, and yet, it is certainly not boring. It is certainly not static. And um, I would never look at it and say, well, my goodness, that's a very symmetrical painting. Now, hang on a second. Look at all the dynamism we have built into what's happening on the edges of this painting. And we're gonna get into what's causing that. And that is these lovely arabesques. Watch this. I want you to look at this figure here. I want you to look at this figure here and then these three figures here. And what you'll notice is this. Do you see that? Do you see that perfect curve coming right up through there and right around there? Do you see how the highlights, when you squint and look at this, okay? Squint down and look at this, and you cannot help but see this perfect spiraling pattern, right? And that is certainly no accident, folks. And what is that doing? What is this doing to our eyes? It's making us go whoop right here to our focal point. And how cool is that? What a nifty thing to be able to notice. Um, by the way, I'm saying hi, folks. I see you on YouTube as well. I'm glad you're joining on YouTube. Thanks for hanging out here. Uh, something's going on with Behance right now. So um, I'm going to try and check both chats if I can. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, I don't know what happened, Steve. I don't know why it's it's the way it is right here, but I'm glad you all are here. Uh, alrighty, but check that out. How perfect is that curve? And does that remind you of anything? If you remember last week, we took a little glance at the golden mean, the golden ratio, right? That perfect Fibonacci spiral. And I'm just gonna lay that on top here for a moment. And my goodness sakes, do you see what's happening here? That is that, look at that perfect curve that way delightful. There it goes. Isn't that nice? Boy, I'm curious. What would happen if I flipped that vertically? Let's see here. Stick it on. There we go. Flip that vertically. Oh my goodness. Even better. Oh wow. What do you see there? And then where do we wind up? Right here on this bow and arrow and it's directing our attention with the arrow right back to our focal point. Listen, I know it's fun to do these things like this. Lay a little Fibonacci spiral on it and imagine that it's just coincidence that it works out that way, but I have to think it isn't. Um, all right, so let's hide that for a moment. Anyhow, back to what I'm doing here with these the drawing. I'm gonna use a different color so it's really obvious. Here we go. So we've got this action right here. How perfect is that? All right, now let's go and look at some smaller passages here because I want you to notice something. I want you to go from the face here, the right side of the face, right on down the torso, okay, and across the hip. And what are you getting here? You're getting another lovely arabesque pointing us right towards that. Do you see how that rhythm works? That rhythm in that painting? Right around like so, right? And of course, I'm not drawing it as well as I could, but I think you get the idea. Okay, and let's look at this. Even better. And this, we can go down that way. We get interrupted by this, and what does it do? 
it pulls us right back up to here. All right, you wanna take this and you wanna carry it around and bam, here we get to another focal point, this woman, okay? Look at her face there. And there are more, folks. Look at this rhythm right here. See that? Look at that rhythm. Right across the shoulder, up through the torso, and right to where we need to be. Okay, S curves and C curves all over the place. Watch this. You can pass through a figure and pick up a curve. I'm gonna come here, okay? And then watch this. Right on through to that leg. This is no accident. Why does this line up so beautifully with that? Right, we call that an implied line a lot of the times, an implied line. Right, so this leading line here, which is a really lovely passage, gets us right to there, okay? What happens if I take that same line down this way? What do I get? Look at that curve, right into the head of what I assume is some kind of dolphin. I have no idea what that fish is supposed to be. It's some kind of sea serpent, I'll just say that, okay? Can't ask the artist, the artist isn't here. All right, but if you get in on this a little closer, you're gonna notice that you're gonna pick up all kinds of smaller ones as well, right? And you just can't help noticing them. Watch this, in and out. See that? In and out around that leg. Beautiful. All right, they're everywhere, gang. They're everywhere, everywhere you look. You just can't help noticing them. So I want to point out something else here. Now we haven't talked about this very much and that is when you have multiple figures in an illustration, I want you to notice how those figures are directing your attention with their eyes. So let's hide this for just a sec. And what happens when I get my eyes stuck in this corner of the composition? I'm looking at the painting, I'm traveling through and I get up here. What does the artist want us to do? not to just exit the canvas and say, well, I'm done with that painting. No, 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 no. How do they get us to come back to the action? Well, look at this figure. Which direction is that figure looking? Well, this way, saying, hey, Kyle, when you get up to this corner, make sure you come on back down that way. Okay, pretty cool, right? How about this figure? Yep, looking the same direction, saying, hey, in case you missed it from this cat, Here's somebody else giving you the little clue. How about this figure? Come on down, folks. How about this figure? Hey, look this way. All right, now, what is she doing? She's telling me, hey, I know you've been focusing on me. I'm really lovely over here and I'm the focus. Okay, that's great, but hey, did you, did you check out what's happening up here? Let's go around there and see what's going on and come right on back down, okay? And then look at this. This figure, this face here looking in this direction and him looking right back. Okay, so that gives us that tension there. We're trapped, we go back and forth and back and forth, and we figure out that relationship there, okay? What is this person doing? He's saying, I know you got trapped down here looking at my wings and looking at these weird sea beasts, but don't forget to direct your attention back up that way, right? Same kind of tension we have here between these two figures, which is a great balance for what's happening over here, right? Are we in danger? of losing ourselves with this guy moving off and up to the right. You have to wonder, right, is that a risk? The reason I would say no is because the face here is painted more darkly, there's um, less contrast there than there is here, and so when I get to a darker area, right, I might hang out there for a minute, but my attention gets pulled back up to the lighter figures, I get stuck in that same beautiful spiral and I wind up back to where I should be. Okay, so these are some really nifty tricks that the artist is using. So the direction of the, the uh, glance of the figure, we have these beautiful arabesques, okay? And they will not just be limited to the figures. Now remember that figure-ground relationship we talked about where uh, the figure-ground relationship is what is the that shape that's created by all the figures, right? As they relate to the ground that being the background, right? The elements that are not these uh, figurative elements. So here we have our figure, okay? This whole area here, nice little grouping here, 
Again, when you have these multiple elements, what do you do? You overlap and you overlap and you overlap and you use contrast, okay, to create a grouping, right? And this is going to be sitting against the ground, figure, ground, relationship. Great contrast here. Why is this area so dark? Well, I don't want to get stuck down here, do I? I want to come up to the light. Dark down here as well. Dark in this corner, dark in that corner. Is that an accident? Certainly not. Only area of mild contrast we have here. Kicks me back this way, right? And here we have this other figure. Now these three are on their own up here. And what does that do? It adds balance to this large grouping we have here that's really tight. This grouping down here is dense, isn't it? So how do you counterbalance that? Well, you add a bunch of space here with the sky, right? Some air, some room to breathe, and then boom, 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 you throw these figures in there as well. Really fantastic. So much more to say about this. I wanna lay my armature back on there one more time and just point out one cool thing. We talked about triangles, the power of triangles. I want you to just notice the strength of the triangles in this painting here where I go like this, okay? What do you see? Look at how perfect that is. Do you see the diagonal right here of this figure? The arm onto the pole, the torso, and then see this right here? This uh, rope that she's holding, okay? It all connects down to the hand and right down to here. This creates a perfect passage for us and that triangle's gonna hit right there, and then we come down right through the hair there, the body there, the body there, the contrast there, what do you get? Nice powerful triangle there, and then let's take a look as well at this configuration. Couldn't get more perfect than that. And it's all occupying that top third. See that, how we're dividing things up? Middle third has predominantly faces, doesn't it? Right? So we're going to hang out there and pay attention to that. Got to have one down here to kick us back up to where we need to be. What a masterful use of these compositional tricks. Let's check out something completely different. This is the Night Watch by our good friend Rembrandt. Okay, And if you'll like, allow me a pause for a moment, I'm just going to have a little sip of my rasa. And uh, boy, I tell you, this is something I've been enjoying lately because I can't drink coffee right now. I've got some issues with that. And I'm drinking this stuff called Rasa and it's, it's a yummy, yummy, yummy. I'm um, checking out some chat here and I see that I am now back on Behance. Well, that's, that's good news. Um, alrighty. Hey Paco, what's up? I hope you were instrumental in getting this all fixed because I know you're the man and you know how to fix this stuff. Alrighty, well look, look at this. This is a completely different kind of a piece. Now, when you first look at this, you say, boy, golly gee whiz, they sure did cram these figures down at the bottom, did they not? Look, everybody's just way down here, right? This whole section of the painting is, is figures, 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 figures. Uh, but hang on a minute. You know, there's more to it than that. I want to talk about the leading lines in this painting because Holy cow, there are so many of them. And this painting is all about leading lines. And the artist Rembrandt is using uh, these props that are just so handy for that because they happen to be perfectly straight, okay? And what I'm talking about specifically are all these spears and muskets, alrighty? Spears and muskets, weapons, and um, boy, every single one of them is doing a little job on us, okay? And not just that, but the architecture as well. Now let's take a look. Hopefully that's not too dark for you all to see. I've tried to lighten this painting up as much as I could. I may even try and lighten it up even a bit more. I know this is not what it would look like if you were viewing it in person, but it helps us to see the elements that are directing our attention where it needs to go. Um, now, let's take a look. What is this thing doing? Why that spear? Why that angle? Why? Could have been doing this. Could have gone that way. Could have gone that way. But oh no. It is in a perfect location 
to direct us to this fellow here, okay? And let me ask you something about this guy. Look at everyone else in the painting with the exception of this girl here, okay? Look at everybody else. What are they wearing? Darker tones, darker tones, darker tones, darker tones, darker tones, everywhere. And if I go back to the original painting, okay, look at that. Holy cow. There's no question as to where a direction that I'm going to move. I'm going to say he's looking over there. Oh, she's looking over there. Back and forth and back and forth. And look who's trapped in the middle. This guy. So I can't help but miss him, can I? I'm going to actually have to just hit that spot, right? But back to the leading lines. One. Okay, no mistake there. What about if I get stuck in this big dark corner? What's taking me back? Look at this flagpole. It's saying, hey, did you see her? Hey, dummy. Look at that. Okay. What about this spear here? This guy, he's holding this spear here, right? Well, wait a second. Look at this angle. Bam. Absolutely not a not a uh, mistake. Okay. So let me turn on this high res. Uh, high res. Listen to me. Um, brighter painting here. Okay, so you can really see what's going on. And you're gonna see some other evidence of some great leading lines as well, as well as some beautiful parallels. I love this. Look at this angle here, look at this angle here, okay? Bam, there it is again, All right? So we're having a nice echoing effect going on, All right? You could almost count this one as well, but I'm just gonna bounce here, bounce here, bounce here. You can't help but be drawn to repetition. That's something that we just can't help as human beings. It's something that we notice right away. We see patterns, okay? Let's look at the background in this painting for a moment. See all the vertical action we have? First of all, all these spears stacked up here, okay? But then we've also got vertical, 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 all this stability, but also these vertical lines are forcing us to go downwards towards the area where the light is, okay? I'll turn on that original painting. See how dark that is? I can't help but bring myself down this way because I want to move from the darkness into the light. But, let me turn that light one back on. Rembrandt was very clever to make absolutely certain that he reinforced that idea by making the background have these very clear vertical pathways, okay? These leading lines that are vertical. And just to prevent us from having a boring uh, background here that's too repetitive, what does he do here? Ah, throws in a beautiful arch, okay? That's a great way to interrupt that. What else does it do? Well, it kicks things off center. Okay, let me just center that, there we go. Kicks things off center, right, to give us some counterweight here to all this cluster of uh, spears that are over here. So you got this sort of, let me do this. You got this kind of a zigzaggy kind of pattern going here, right? Now he could have done that over here but he didn't because that would have been dull and boring. And what does he do instead? No, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a nice curvilinear passage to kick you on back down this way. And if you come down the other side, where do you go? You go to our other focal point right here, okay? Look at that perfect leading line hitting us that way. All right, where's this guy looking? Everybody, check out their, their gazes, okay? On the sides, we always have somebody redirecting us back, redirecting us back to where the action is. Okay, no accident there, right? Even this guy right here, looking up that way, no accident. So lots to talk about with this masterpiece. You know, my wife actually saw this painting in person. I'm, I can't say I'm not envious. She went to Amsterdam and wow, lucky, lucky. Rasa, okay. Let's hide that and we'll do one more here. Actually two more because I want to show you a more modern painting in a moment. Um, but let's first take a look at this classic Botticelli. Botticelli. This is uh, Venus, okay, and I'm gonna do something fun here. And I want you all to try this with uh, paintings you admire. Bring a painting into Photoshop, okay? And I want you to do this, I want you to Duplicate that layer, alrighty, and right above it I'm going to create another layer and I'm going to select the layer underneath. Now how did I do that? I held down the command key and I tapped on the image 
part of the layer of the image preview right there. Just tap on that. Boop. By holding down the command key and doing that on a on an Apple on a, a PC, I think you hold down Control and then tap right on that. It's going to select the layer contents. So I've selected the layer contents of that layer, which is this rectangle, and I'm on a layer above it, and I'm going to fill it with black. Okay, there. Now what have I done? Well, I've hidden the picture. So now you can make you can make believe it's anything you like. No, that's not the trick. Here's the trick. You're going to go over to your blend modes, right? You see this little drop down right here? Currently it says normal, and you come on down to hue, saturation, color, see all those? And you're gonna select color, all right? And just like that, what you're giving yourself is a little grayscale preview. And I'm gonna merge those layers together. Okay, so select both layers, Command E or Control E on the PC. Um, and now I've got this layer here, and here's the fun thing I'm gonna do. Come to your filters, right? And come on down to noise and select median, all right? It gives me a little preview. So you can blast this out and go crazy, right? Look at that, cool. It's kind of like blurring, but not, right? Uh, so I'm gonna hit it at about, yeah, I think something like 12, 13, 14. Something in that vicinity. I like 13, that's looking good. 13's a lucky number, right? Um, right, takes the lights, really pushes them. And why did I do this? Well, this is gonna allow me to see something that we haven't yet really paid attention to and talked too much about. We have a little bit, little bit on day one, um, but how you group your values in your work. All right, and I wanna show you this beautiful asymmetrical balance that was achieved here in this painting by highlighting specifically the darks, okay? I want you to look at this gigantic shape we have here, and let me outline that for you, okay? So we're gonna go like this. All right, now look at that whole chunk of the painting, right? And you're gonna get big darks in through here, big darks here, dark, 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 dark. okay? And if I look at that, I say, man, that you would think that that would kick me over to the right and all that, all that dark, right, with that heavy contrast because we have this perfect shape here, right, that is highlighted, popping right off that dark, that white on black, essentially, right? You see that, that high contrast, white figure, black background, and you say, well, how would I, how would I not just hang out on the right side? It would be too heavily weighted. However, how is that counterbalanced? Well, look at this area right here, okay? That's what I'm talking about, okay? L, the, that unknown artist we looked at a moment ago, where at the bottom of the painting you had this dense collection of figures and they're all overlapping and they're all in there, all tight, cozy, right? And the way that he counterbalanced that was to have those three angels up uh, above, or cherubs, you know? Well, look at this. We've got this big, dark shape here, right? Taking up, you know, well, a whole third of the canvas, essentially. What do you do? You throw in these darks as separate shapes over here, Right, and that is a perfect counterbalance. Let's look at the actual painting while we're doing this here, okay? So just check that out. Now, when you first look at this painting, okay, you might be wondering why on earth would these wings be so dark? Look how heavy that contrast is, okay? But now you know, now you know. We are essentially making some really nice shapes here, okay, on this side. And I'll just add a little bit here to make sure we capture all that. Excellent, look at that shadow. Is that a necessary shadow? Why put it there? Why put it there at all? Well, for the reason we're talking about right here, right? And then you have on this side, dark, dark, dark. And really, you know, when we do that thing with our median filter, these get blended together, these tree trunks, right? But if you wanna get a little bit more specific, we'll just do this, okay? I should probably use black for that so we can really pop that up. Um, knock this back. 
pretty nifty configuration there of darks. I love it, I love it. So we haven't talked too much about it, but values, values are so important in how you balance out your um, your composition. But it's just a lot to think about, I know. But quickly, let's jump back here to this little version that we have. I love this. And then I'm going to lay on top of it. Uh, we've looked at our shapes here. Oh, what do we have here? What do we have here? This is our good friend, the golden mean, right? Fibonacci spiral. Now, I just want you to notice that this composition, this painting was done uh, with the ratio for height to width, making a perfect golden rectangle, right? So why don't we just hide this for a moment and I'll reduce the opacity because I want you to notice some things about how this works. So here is that square that we have, okay? And I'll highlight that for you. You can see it. Here's that square, right? Which is our section of that golden rectangle. Um, and then we have the 1.68 or whatever it happens to be, that, that division that gives us this section right here. It's rectangle off to the right. And look what happens when I bisect that diagonally. Where do we go? Oh my gosh. Perfect shot, right? Right up to our focal point. And then I want you to also notice that if I were to take this spiral and come over to this side here, look at that strong diagonal that we have of this figure from her foot straight on up to her hand. It is absolutely perfect. Right? I mean, it could, it's not even off by, by a centimeter. It is following that line perfectly. Do you think an artist like Botticelli was not aware of this? I certainly don't. Um, now let's look at this spiral. Comes right around that shell, okay, and kicks us on up to perfect focal point right there. I love that. Okay. And let me hide that for just a moment because I want to talk a little bit about our arabesques. So what do you see? They're everywhere, right? I want you folks to just think about this for a moment and tell me where you see these lines of action, these leading lines, these arabesques that are so perfectly working throughout this piece to add that rhythm and that continuity and that flow, right? Let's look at this hand and I want you to come with me on this little journey. We're going to first kick it right outside the hand, in fact, from this part of the landscape because I want you to see something. Ready? Whoa, beautiful little line. And then up, and what happens when we come around the back? Oh, implied line straight through the head into there. And we come around and look at how easily that flows there. Okay, and then how that, look at this. Absolutely perfect. And around we go. Oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Okay, too much, too much to look at. And then with this figure, you come right up through here and around there. That's gorgeous, right? What happens if I just follow that through? I can go that way, I can go this way. Doesn't matter, right? It's all there. Delightful. So, these artists knew what they were doing. Let's take a look at something a little more contemporary. Here is our good friend, James Jean, Los Angeles-based um, painter, illustrator, artist. Some might say genius. I wouldn't argue with them. Here's just one of the many hundreds of incredible illustrations he has treated us all to. Um, while your eyes are just soaking that in, I want to check the chat, see if we have any questions about anything. Let's see here. So I'm looking at YouTube. It looks like um, everyone has kicked it over to Behance, hopefully. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Hello, gang. All right, let's see. What is the painting telling us? I mean, painter's thought behind the painting. Please tell me. Leo, um, are you speaking about the... Birth of Venus painting by Botticelli. Please be specific. Let me know which one you're talking about. Um, yeah, Juan, when you use that uh, median filter, it is kind of like you're creating a, 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 a squinting kind of a look. I agree with that. Hey, Kyle, can you tell a dad joke? 
You know, um, Anna, I had a joke about time travel, but you didn't like it. Might take us all a minute to get that one, but uh, I hope that does the trick for you. Um, okay, Leo's saying yes. Yes, I guess you're talking about the birth of Venus. What is the artist telling us? Well, that's a complicated question because you have to look at so much of the context for when this was when was this painted okay during the renaissance um what was that uh that motivation for painting a, a piece like this um there is so much to talk about here we have mythology that's involved uh we have the wish uh the wishes of whoever commissioned this work i believe it was a commissioned piece um, what would they want to see in such a painting? You have to have Botticelli's own viewpoints on many things. I'm sure that some of what we're looking at in this painting is not necessarily strictly about the subject matter, uh, Venus and the story of her birth, but there could be some um, other stuff going on that was more political or um, making comments about uh, society at the time. I don't know the history of this painting very well. All I know is that it's uh, in the Uffizi, in Florence, Italy, uh, but we're near giving it the, the justice it, it deserves. Um, the colors are off a little bit. and But to answer that question, you'd have to be an art historian, and I am not one of those. However, I recommend a little place called Wikipedia, where I would recommend checking out this painting, The Birth of Venus. There's probably all kinds of great information there about how it was commissioned, why it was commissioned, if it was commissioned. Uh, the, but I'm not. Okie dokie. So... I'll check this out. I'm just going to turn one on here for a moment and I'm going to lighten this and look at that. Look, I didn't even have to use more than the basic diagonals, right? From our corner to our center here. And uh, you'll forget, forgive me, by the way, there's a term for these, for these particular lines, these diagonals um, that I am blanking on right now. So my apologies. Uh, but look, turn those on. This is for our vertical center right here. And look at how this frames our figure right there at the focal point. I just think that's so neat, All right? It just touches the top of the head right there, coming on down. The left third, right, and the middle third, called the sinister. Uh, but you all can look that up. And then how about this little froggy? perfectly positioned down here on that other third. I just love the way this is composed. And look at how the horse fits in, okay, that little triangle area right there. Um, this is clearly a triangular foundation for this composition here. And what is the repetitive element? And those verticals are everywhere. Let's use a lighter color here. They are all very important. So I'm just gonna do a more accurate line here for this guy and this one okay and then this one and i want you to notice something spacing okay see this spacing now if you're going to add these kinds of repetitive elements okay these these verticals here what is it that you want to avoid well you want to avoid equal amounts of space between each of these repeating elements because the repetition is one thing. That's enough to sort of keep us understanding this motif, right? But if you have them all equally spaced, okay, one between the other, that's when, again, you get into trouble and it gets a little boring, okay? So look over on this side, right? We got one here, we got one here, then we got there, and then there, right? And then all the way over here. The spacing for each of these is completely different, and that's what adds interest. I love it. I love it. So definitely something that creates balance, right? How do we get from down here up to here? Well, don't worry, these verticals are all pushing us up in that direction. I'll hide this for just a moment. And we'll just look at the original painting here in all its glory. And I wanna talk a little bit about color. How are we able to use color in a way that is um, gonna catch your attention and lead you to the right places? So take a look at our figure and our 
horse, okay? And what you'll notice is they are the only areas in the painting, right, where we have these, use a different color so you can see this, I hope you can see this. Now, boy, this color, this is a colorful painting, so it's hard to find some that'll, that'll really pop. There we go. All right. Just look at this. The tail of the horse, okay? The mane of the horse. What is this doing? It's creating a sort of a shape here to frame separately the darks that are contained within that shape. So it's almost like you have this stuff all around here turns into almost a singular shape or a singular part of the painting that has its own language, okay? Because everything there is the same. What is it? It's up and it's interrupted with something and it's up and it's interrupted with something, right? But then when you come into the center here of the painting, you get this long arabesque, right? And then that gets interrupted by her and she's coming on down like that. Another beautiful passage, okay? And then another long, 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 long curvilinear passage there, right? And up and over. Check this one out. Oh my gosh, isn't that gorgeous? Try and do a little better job. There, that's better, All right? No accident there. That's so lovely. And then back and up. I love this. All right, so it's not that these methods and these techniques and these ideas have been abandoned in contemporary illustration and art. No, they're still kicking around, okay? But maybe not as much as they could be, but you can all change that. You can do fantastic work. All right, so what do we do? Let's put this all into practice a little bit, all right? We've got a little bit of time left. So I thought it'd be cool to do something with Hansel and Gretel. Just, they're nifty characters, right? Um, so let's do this. We'll give ourselves some thumbnails. All right, do another one over here. Some layout options. Now thumbnails are so good for this. All right, now how could I make that interesting? Well, if you want to, you could start with a little armature, right? If that helps you to kind of see things. Like so, right? Maybe that's something that you want to do. Give yourself a little place. The house, it's in a little clearing or something. And I could put some foliage there. And maybe there's some tree trunks there. Interrupt some of that. Alrighty. Leave a couple of hollow bits for the trunks to come out. And I want uh, Hansel and Gretel maybe to be right here in the extreme foreground. And maybe they're just showing up Like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? So there's one stepping over this way and one there. And maybe there's a bit of foliage here interrupting what's happening and I can pull a little tree in front of it over in this corner, right? Start to think about dark and light. Maybe the sun is hitting it from the front. So this is gonna be dark, cast a little shadow back there. And then back here we have some more darks. And maybe the figures here are dark as well. And I have to make sure that those silhouettes are gonna be interesting, but that's one way to work it. Get some more darks in here from some leaves and whatnot. Okay, little pathway. Throw some more woody stuff in here. And that could be the beginnings of that composition. Okay, 
Now, I could interrupt a lot of this dark stuff with a little hit every now and then, a little twig or something, whatever, right? The leading lines. All right, so I want to make us go here. Okay, so I would use branches and things that would point out down that way, and that could be one thumbnail. Now, let's completely change this. What about if we do it this way? What about if we have one figure here stepping forward and saying, oh, what have we got there? What's down there? And then another figure here pointing. Okay, let me move that up a little bit. There we go. Cast some shadows across their bodies. And then make sure their faces are nice and bright and highlight it against the dark of the woods here. Make sure we have some dark shapes all around there. And maybe the whole shot is just them coming out of the woods and they're looking, they see something, but we can't see what it is, okay? Some cool roots and things of some trees back here. All right, and the sunlight's gonna be coming over from this side, lighting stuff up. And then just to keep things moving towards where I need, I would have some branches coming in this way and leading us down towards their faces, okay? So, leading lines, leading lines. I wanna make sure we're going this way. Make that a little brighter, there we go. I wanna make sure we're going around to here, one focal point, so high contrast, okay? Make sure that I hit that with the lights. The middle grays and things, our midtones would fill in back here, okay, and here. So give the attention to that roof with some highlights there. Midtones, midtones, midtones. Couple of midtones maybe in the clothing and whatnot. Some midtones back here. There we go. And that's one thumbnail, and then over here, some midtones as well, all throughout the forest. And in the background there, with the light illuminating some of the area down here as this thing opens up from the forest, okay? Mostly mid-tones here with the clothing and then really hit those faces with some light there. Now, why work this rough? Why would you do this? Well, this is how you figure out how the image is gonna work, okay? So then what you can do is go ahead and duplicate it and go to filter again and try median First, we gotta blur it. I'm sorry. Got to blur, Gaussian blur, and we'll blend all these together. There we go. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Give it a nice blur, maybe like a value of four, maybe six. Let's try six and see how that looks. Okay. And now I'm gonna hit it with that median. So go to noise and median. Okay, we'll do a little less there. Okay, and see how things read. And then I can look at it and say, all right, I know I got a pop out. There's highlight number one, number two. Okay, just give them that little light right there. And that's pretty much it. Those are gonna be the areas I want people to focus on, okay? 
and then number two, one face, another face over here, the arm pointing forward, maybe hit a little light on the shoulder there, maybe some rocks or his little branches catching some light there. And that's going to be it. And then what I do is I take one of these, okay, maybe I like this one, and I hide these. Um, and really start to work on making that look good, okay? So this is where I would just do a line art sketch. Just say, all right, now Hansel is maybe here and he's emerging out of the woods here. And maybe there's there's some uh, stuff blocking our view of the whole figure. So we add overlap, right? So we got one figure here. And then Gretel right next to him. that and then start to work out whatever the architectural details are for that little house there and get that all nice get some little bushes and shrubs around there start to work in some of these lines I want to lead me back here okay some branches coming down that way crossing over the figure here and there so we know where we are Right? And then that becomes the beginning of the piece that I would then work on. Now I would love to have some little things coming across here and some little details that I could add, such as an animal sitting like right there, right? Maybe something right on that quarter if I go half and half, something like that. And then I would start to play with alignment and use that armature to my advantage and move things to where I feel like I can take advantage of some of these diagonals. But that's the process, guys. So I hope you find that helpful and useful. Um, anyway, we'll pick this up again next week and I'll do a drawing for you. And I hope you guys can just have a great weekend, stay safe, and remember to please be kind. Everybody take care and I'll see you next time. Ciao for now.